Would the princess be sad, relieved? How would she be tonight, now that all this is out? She is relieved that, at last, the lying is over, the masquerade is over, that the whole thing is out in the open. You think that's a possibility, that there'll be more revelations about third parties, despite what the palace says? The fact that the Camilla Gate tapes, the so-called Camilla Gate tapes, have not yet been published remains a sword of Damocles hanging over Prince Charles's head and could fatally damage his position. Fairy tales usually end at this point with the simple phrase, they lived happily ever after. The Princess of Wales was a new kind of royal. A new word began to appear in the media's vocabulary, die mania. The Princess of Wales has agreed to Prince Charles's request for a divorce. In some small way, I have been of service in return. The Princess of Wales has died in a car accident. At Buckingham Palace, telegrams of condolence have been arriving from leaders around the world. Well, I think Princess Diana, like the rest of the world, was caught up in the fairy tale that was her own royal relationship, and she was willing it to work, as was everyone else. Actually, the reality behind Palace Gates is that pretty quickly it had started falling apart. I think very quickly the reality set in that she didn't have much in common with Prince Charles, and actually they were very different people with very different interests, and that's when the cracks started appearing, and, and people have suggested, and we now know that that was very soon after they returned from their honeymoon, so very early on in the marriage. So he's, he's basically a very kind, and thoughtful and very sensitive person. And he just uh, didn't understand somebody uh, uh, like Diana. She was much too young for him. Well, I used to say that Diana was a high school dropout and Charles was a university lecturer. I mean, Diana, they were so different. And obviously that can work very well, but she was very, very young. And she'd had no experience of life. And although she'd lived on the Sandringham estate and knew the royal family. She didn't really know the royal family. And unless she didn't really know what it would be like to be married into them. Place. Have you cooked a breakfast yet? <laughs> I think she thought it was all going to be um, sort of wonderful. Um, so she'd been disappointed from the very beginning. And, and she just, she had this vision of Charles, which wasn't really him at all. I mean, and then she started to find Charles very dull. And he found her stupid. I mean, she had a very quick wit, but she wasn't well read. She wasn't really educated. And Charles was highly educated. My years at West Heath were certainly very happy ones indeed. I made many friends who I often see. And in spite of what Miss Fudge and my other teachers may have thought at the time, I did actually learn something. <laughs> So you would never have known by my O-level results. <laughs> All his friends were much, much older. So he started to dump his friends. Um, and Diana's friends were all much, much younger. And so they started to lead separate lives very, very early on. And then Diana had children very, very quickly. I mean, William was born in 82, and she'd only got married in 81. 
um, and she had a very difficult pregnancy with William. So she was, you know, she was getting used to being royal. She was, she was pregnant. She, the marriage wasn't quite what she imagined it, but she thought it would all be all right. So she was living on a dream, really. The rest of the royal family and the royal household, they treated Diana as if she was just another girl. In fact, they didn't give her much consideration at all. I did notice that one day, going through the drawing room, the old Queen Mother, she passed the magazine table and Diana's face was on the front of Hello Magazine or something. And as she walked past the table, she flipped the magazine over onto its backside and carried on walking. That to me said, she's not really accepted. They don't like it. She's beginning to outshine even the senior members of the royal family. This is dangerous territory. The Queen and Diana weren't pally pally because Diana, she, she was too young. She didn't want to sit. And, she said, I don't want to have dinner with Brenda. She used to call her Brenda. In those days, there was um, a satirical uh, story that used to run in private eye every week. And, uh, and she, the Queen was Brenda, and I think Prince Philip was Stavros. But you see, Eudana was very quick-witted, but she just, she didn't want to have dinner with the Queen on her own, because she said, I don't, and I wouldn't know what to say to her. Well, the, the, I think Prince Philip, when he heard she was coming, he'd go into another room. So he just didn't want the confrontation with her. But at the beginning, yes, he had a very good relationship with her, and he looked after her, and he made sure that she sat next to him at dinner, and he brought her into the conversation. He could see how nervous she was of the whole situation. And I think the Queen really let him deal with it. She was painting a very tragic picture of how she was pitched into the royal family without any form of help, without any form of rehearsal, and how they were not able to help her evolve and grow up and weren't able to appreciate what she was trying to do or give her the lessons which she very much needed. I think after Harry was born, the relationship seriously broke down. It was, um, it just hadn't worked out like both of, both of them expected. And, and even before the wedding, Diana had serious doubts and so did Charles, but it was too late. And her sisters famously said, but Dutch, which was her nickname, your face is on the tea towels. And it's a great line. I know it's been used a lot, but it does sum it all up. It's too late. And Charles's friends, his close, close friends, warned him, this is not going to work, Charles. This is, she's too young, she's too naive, and, you know, you're an imaginary prince. She doesn't know you at all. So it had very little chance. And then if you add that mix to the huge and unprecedented interest in the couple, well, in, especially in Diana, you know, you, you can see it reach boiling point. The public admired the couple deeply. She was cherished as the people's princess, and he held the title of the Prince of Wales. With two newborn children beloved by the nation and all the wealth they could desire, they seemed to have it all. However, beneath the surface, both were profoundly unhappy in their marriage. I think, by and large, the, the national press were very good to Diana in their reporting. How well you're coping with all the press attention? Well, as you can, you can see, you can tell. <laughs> Are you bearing up with it quite well, though? Because it must be quite a strain with all of us, aren't you? Well, it is, naturally. And you're, you're keeping it all right, though. You seem to be doing very well. well I'm still ran. <laughs> well, Charles was so used to having all the attention on him, which it had been since he was born, um, he, he didn't like the idea that they walked down a street, say, when they were doing a, a, a royal engagement, and the crowd were calling, Diana, Diana. So he felt surplus and didn't really know what to do with himself and made lots of sort of rather pathetic remarks like there should be two of me and if I cut myself in half. I mean, he didn't know what to do or say. And, and yes, he, 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 it was a form of, of, of jealousy. Yes, it was. When love eluded them within their own marriage, both Charles and Diana sought affection outside of their household. They each became involved in extramarital relationships.
Charles later revealed to his official biographer, Jonathan Dimbleby, that he rekindled his romance with Camilla Parker Bowles in 1986. Well, Charles was in love with Camilla from a very early age. You know, when he was still in the Navy, he fell in love with Camilla. She always knew that there was someone else in the background waiting. She knew it on her wedding day. And again, if you look at the footage of Princess Diana walking down the aisle with her father, you will see her looking from side to side. And she once said to me, you know what I'm doing, don't you? I'm looking for her. And she was there. Even on my wedding day, she was sat there in the congregation. You see, Camilla Parker Bowles has been that ghost, always there throughout the princess's life. Meanwhile, it's believed that Diana began her affair with Army Captain James Hewitt around a similar period. Hewitt gained public attention in 1986 when he crossed paths with Princess Diana at a party. Shortly after, he took on the role of her riding instructor and their relationship soon turned romantic, a connection that would endure for several years. It was difficult for me to tread the path between Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Now Diana arrived every weekend with the boys on Friday afternoon and left every Sunday. But someone else occupied that space in between. And I learned to serve two royal mistresses, one Princess of Wales and the other Mrs. Parker Bowles. This was still a secret. I was keeping this secret from both the prince and the princess until, of course, it became intolerable. Well, Camilla lived near Charles at Highgrove, and Charles used to see her on Sundays. So when, when Diana drove back to London, to Kensington Palace, Charles would be out, out at the other end of the drive, driving off to uh, Camilla's house, or she would be coming to Highgrove. And Diana knew perfectly well this was happening. Um, so that they sort of had Sundays for Camilla. By the time Diana met Hewitt, her marriage to Prince Charles was already strained, and reportedly Charles was too preoccupied with rekindling his relationship with his former girlfriend, Camilla, to be concerned. I think Diana was terrified. She says she was. And she looked for Charles. She was looking. They went to uh, uh, Annabel Goldsmith's house, um, beautiful house in Richmond, and there was a, it was a big party on, on probably on three or four floors, and she looked around, where's Charles, where's Charles? And then she uh, realised that he must be downstairs on the, on the lower level in the sort of basement area. And she went down there, and there they were. And then, you know, she, she obviously got this real anger, because you'd have to be very angry to do that, and brave, and she just confronted Camilla and said, you know, don't, I'm not stupid, I know what's going on. So Camilla must have been completely taken aback. I mean, you don't expect that to happen. Diana was shaking with fear and rage. And um, on the way back in the car, she was just in hysterical tears. And her, her protection officer, Ken Wharf, was with her, and, and so and he, he confirms all this, that she just sobbed all the way home, and I don't think Charles said a word. In December 1992, Prime Minister John Major announced to the House of Commons that the Prince and Princess of Wales were separating. The Waleses were a very unhappy couple, in contrast to the hopes expressed when they became engaged. Charles said at that time he was surprised she was willing to put up with him. So, were they in love? Of course. Whatever in love means. Joining me now in the studio is Andrew Morton, the author of Diana, Her True Story, which brought to the public's attention the state of the royal marriage. Mr Morton, the palace said today that no third party is involved. Can that be right? Ostensibly, no, but uh, uh, given the fact that the Princess of Wales believes that Prince Charles's friendship with another woman, Camilla Parker Bowles, has cast a long shadow over that marriage, uh, must be considered when you look at the failure of this 11-year union. 
Diana, her true story, claimed to tell from the inside the tale of a loveless marriage, with evidence from some of her closest friends. Well, the Andrew Morton book was a sensation. No one had any idea that Diana was involved with the book at all. And in fact, she even denied that she was at the beginning. But what happened was she decided, she made a decision that she wanted the world, if you like, to know the truth of her marriage. In the summer of 92, a recording of Diana speaking to one of her friends, who actually was her lover, James Gilby, appeared in one of the newspapers. The transcript of this recording was unbelievable. It was, and he called her Squidgy, and she, she told him all her woes about, and what she thought about members of the royal family, and, you know, her, the Queen Mother, how the cold the Queen Mother was, and um, it, it was an extraordinary, extraordinary, explosive moment. And really, there was very little that the Queen could do after that. In 1992, tapes of a phone recording between Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles were released, prompting further rumours of unfaithfulness. With thousands of copies of the magazine now being faxed around Britain, some editors are uneasy. Those in the know in London and the chattering classes and those with fax machines to Australia can know what's in it, but the rest of the country doesn't. Buckingham Palace tonight declined to comment on the contents of the magazine. There's been no comment from Mrs Parker Bowles. In the past, her husband has dismissed such allegations as rubbish. He will have to soldier on, knowing that more revelations about his private life, his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles, may well come out in the future. You think that's a possibility, that there'll be more revelations about third parties, despite what the palace is? The fact that the Camilla Gate tapes, the so-called Camilla Gate tapes, have not yet been published remains a sword of Damocles hanging over Prince Charles's head and could fatally damage his position. In an interview in 1994, Prince Charles admitted to committing adultery during his and Diana's marriage. Um, Mrs. Parker Bowles is a great friend of mine. I have a large number of friends that I'm terribly lucky to have. When marriages break down, awful and miserable as that is, that so often you know that it is your friends who are the most important. The Prince of Wales had just been on TV to admit adultery with Camilla Parker Bowles and the princess that evening was due to go out to the Serpentine Gallery to see her old friend, Lord Palumbo. The woman at the centre of these latest royal revelations, Camilla Parker Bowles, was today at home with her family in Wiltshire. It's claimed in a second extract from the Jonathan Dimbleby biography, which is published in today's Sunday Times, that she and the Prince of Wales have had three separate affairs. The Prince of Wales had just been on TV to admit adultery with Camilla Parker Bowles. And the princess that evening was due to go out to the Serpentine Gallery to see her old friend, Lord Palumbo, and open his new exhibition. I can't go. I'm not going. I'm not going. It'll be too humiliating. The whole world now knows that Charles has been having an affair. He's admitted it. You are going, I said. I've got nothing to wear. Yes, you have got something to wear. I went up to her wardrobe room and picked out a Christina Strombolian dress with a fishtail. This is what you're going to wear, I said. I can't fit into it. Yes, you can. Put it on. So she slipped it on. Now, to complement that, I think we should have the pearl choker and the sapphire. That's all you need. High heels and those jewels. Right, she put them on and she went a million dollars. Remember, when you go out there, I said, you stride, you hold your head high, you smile, you engage, firm handshake. Say to yourself, I am Diana, Princess of Wales, and I am here to stay. I am the mother of the future King of England. Say it to yourself.
The only secret Diana ever kept from me was the Martin Bashir interview for Panorama. Now, I'd known Martin Bashir for a long time, and he was one of the men that I used to bring into the palace under a blanket because he didn't want to be seen by anyone. He was never a lover of the princesses. He was just a work associate. He persuaded the princess that she had to have a voice. She needed to tell her story, and what better a vehicle than Panorama? I was sent home on a Sunday afternoon. Strange, I thought. Why would she be sending me home? Go and spend some time with your family. I'm doing nothing this afternoon. Don't worry about me. The minute I'd left the palace, in through the back door comes Marty Bashir and his camera crew, and they set up the, the Prince of Wales sitting room, which she used for that interview. At the age of 19, you always think you're prepared for everything and you think you have the knowledge of what's coming ahead. But although I was daunted at the prospect at the time, I felt I had the support of my husband-to-be. I had no idea that was being done. The next morning I came to work, I noticed all the furniture had been moved. Why have you moved the furniture? It's not in the same place. Um, I had a dance class. I had to move the furniture out of the way just so that we could exercise. Strange strange. She avoided me for the next two days, never spoke to me. How strange, I thought, she's hiding something. And then she told me that she made a recording with Martin Bashir for Manorama. What have you said? Well, I just put the record straight, she said. We didn't know what she said until we saw it. Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. <laughs> 31 million people stopped in their tracks on that Monday night and couldn't believe what they were seeing. The Princess of Wales bearing her heart on national television. We couldn't take our eyes away from it. We couldn't believe what we were hearing. There are three people in my marriage. My husband isn't fit for the top job. I don't, I think it would be, bring him limitations. She was honest, open, and frank. Did you love James Hewitt? Yes, I did. Yes. Were you unfaithful? Yes, I adored him. Yes, I was in love with him. But I was very let down. It was all there. I, I couldn't believe it. It was too raw for most people. And an embarrassment for the royal family. That was the final straw. That was the straw that broke the back of the House of Windsor. From that moment on, Diana was outcast. Her titles were stripped. She was no longer prayed for in church. She was on her own. You do live very much on your own, don't you? Yes, I am. I, I don't mind that, actually. You know, people think that at the end of the day, a man is the only answer. Actually, a fulfilling job is better for me. <laughs> but, 